This week, we're talking to Steve Zarelli to find out all about the world of collecting astronaut autographs. That's right. It's a dark and dangerous world. I love it. <laughs> Plus, we've got two <laughs> weeks worth of news stories to get through. Please continue to get in touch with your thoughts on what we're up to. And we're Space and Things 1 at Space and Things 1 on Twitter and at Space and Things Podcast on Instagram and Facebook. Or leave a review on your podcast platform. And don't forget to hit that share button as well. It really helps us out. But right now, please enjoy episode 62 of the Space and Things podcast. Oh my God. I'm Emily Carney. And I'm Dave Giles. And welcome to episode 62 of our podcast. So, Emily, it's been a couple of weeks because last week uh, I was in another place. <laughs> that's what, <laughs> that's what happened place. there. A good place, don't worry. Um, it was a good place. It was a good place, actually. I just triple booked myself, which is just crazy. So, you have been very busy. It's like you're on fire at the moment. So many things coming at me from different angles and I love it. So uh, we'll, we'll start because this is interesting uh, that you've done another Celestius. Oh, I can never say it. Yeah, Celestius. it's okay. Celestius. Yeah, that's that's right. And you've done yeah. another Celestius article. So let's start with this one because it's also about someone whose name I can't pronounce, which is appropriate being one. What just happened? <laughs> um, well, it's an article about, a, I believe I'm saying his name right. He was uh, he was German. He was born in Germany. His name is Kraft Ericke. Dr. Kraft Ericke, I believe is how it's pronounced. And uh, he's a rocket pioneer and uh, probably not as well known as like Von Braun or Oberth or Goddard or other people, but he is a rocket pioneer. And basically the article is sort of about the history of his life. And he was probably one of the, before Gerard K. O'Neill, beep, uh, <laughs> <laughs> before uh, O'Neill wrote The High Frontier, uh, Eric, he had his own version of that. Like it, it wasn't obviously not, you know, not the high frontier, but he had sort of his own vision that was very similar to that called the uh, extraterrestrial imperative. Basically, the the premise behind that was, you know, innovation is limitless and human beings are creative and really there's no limit to us, you know, and humans are going to be sort of, I guess, uh, hardwired to go to space eventually because that's what we do. We explore. So I read an article about him, and it was a lot of fun to write. I, I'll admit, when I first started researching it, I didn't know a lot about him, which I'm embarrassed about, because he's the inventor of the Centaur stage. And, oh. uh, yeah, which is still in use. Um, I, The Centaur started uh, getting developed before even NASA was an agency. I believe they started developing it in early 1958, before NASA even was called NASA. And um, it was the NACA at the time. And I believe the first Centaur flew in 1962 was a it was a failure. The first one, the first flight didn't quite work out at the time. You know, he had a lot of detractors who were basically like, well, this is never going to work out. You can't use liquid hydrogen. It's too unstable, you know, and eventually uh, the Centaur became very reliable. It helped launch uh, a lot of uh, deep space payloads like sur the surveyors. In the 1970s, it, it helped launch the uh, Voyagers and the uh, Vikings to their destinations. And um, the Centaurs are still being used to this day. So really, that's a pretty that's a pretty amazing invention, if you ask me. Yeah, he did absolutely. a pretty good job. Mm. So I, I'm embarrassed I didn't know more about that because I've written about the Centaur before and I didn't know the person behind it, which is kind of embarrassing. But now I know. So yeah corrected that that's all good yeah so yeah that's that's one article and then uh you're w working for a new company now as well right yeah i have a new day job and um i we focus on a lot of thought leadership so i wrote a blog for uh our we have a uh it's a, a magazine called strixis and uh basically it's a blog and uh the blog is about leadership but i use a lot of space examples in it it's basically a blog about how leadership just boils down to behavior. Some of the examples I, I've act, I, we've actually talked about on the show. Mm. Uh, I talked about uh, Glenn Lunny during Apollo 13. And I also talked about Eileen Collins and some of her, you know, examples of leadership. So uh, I think the space people will enjoy it. It's probably tailored more to executives. 
but it's got i think the space people can relate to it as well and uh and I wrote something else on Medium that upset like 10,000 people, I think. <laughs> so Yeah, you got some grief about that one, which is ridiculous because it's a ridiculously well-written article, in my opinion. But uh, it was something that needed to be said, that's for sure. Yeah, I, I kind of went into that unafraid. So <laughs> I was like, I wasn't happy about some of the comments that I got on Twitter. But at the same time, I was like, well, I'm glad I said what I thought needed to be said. Mm. Yeah, me too. So that article was called An Open Letter to Elon Musk, and it was in response to some jokes that he made on Twitter. Now, I also read the comments that you were getting in response to this, and the amount of uh, comments that seemed to say, oh, you need to get a sense of humor, or you need to uh, lighten up, it's a joke. But humor is all about timing, and the conversation within the space industry at the moment is very much about how uh, women have had a lot of problems with men and misogyny within the space industry, yeah, which needs to be sorted. And your article was really actually extremely polite. Uh, you pointed out uh, loads of things you respect Elon Musk for, but you pointed out rightly so that he's the top of the food chain in terms of the space industry, and he's got a lead by example. So his timing was, you know, awful. You know, these jokes just don't make sense at the moment. And for any women who work underneath him, that must have been awful. But also, the comments you were getting kind of prove you were right as well. Absolutely. They didn't read it. Yeah, absolutely. They didn't read it. Because some people, and I don't know, I'm probably not saying the, the comments verbatim, but some people were like, oh, you know, you're going after Elon Musk. I'm like, I didn't go after him. I honestly did not. I... I, I felt I was very polite and respectful towards him. And, you know, I and I do admire his work. I, I admire his vision. You know, it's yeah, I don't you know, I really do. And I, I mean that, you know, I, if we could get him on our show, hey, I'm all for it, you know. Yeah, me too. <laughs> but it's not going after someone if all you're doing is asking them to think about what they've said. Yeah, that's all I was doing. Just think about it. Is that appropriate? Just have a think. That's not going after someone. Anyway, hopefully, because uh, it did reach a lot of people, this article, hopefully there were some people who read it and saw that they may have found those jokes funny at first and then having read your article have had their minds changed. Let's hope so. Anyway, we've got a lot to get through today. So uh, let's crack on. Okay, we're off to a good start. Play it cool. It's highly likely that if you're listening to this, then you're a collector of some kind of space memorabilia. Collecting and spaceflight seem to go hand in hand. And one of the most obvious things to collect are autographs of astronauts and cosmonauts. So we thought it might be a good idea to talk to one of the experts in the field and someone who can authenticate the autographs of our heroes to make sure we're not getting screwed over by fakes. Yes, today we're talking to Steve Zarelli of Zarelli Space Authentication, one of the biggest names in the field. His letters of authentication have been seen in virtually every credible high-profile auction house and have accompanied some of the most rare and desirable items in this hobby. Be prepared for a world of crime and dubious actions. Yes, it's law and order, space and things. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, Dr. Curran, why were you the only crew member who didn't swear when the first docking attempt failed? Because I was too stupid to realize the serious implications of our trouble. Welcome, Steve, and thank you so much for joining us. So let's set the scene. What started your interest in, in space autographs? And were you a collector as a child? Well, you know, first I want to say, you know, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. And I, I just want to clarify one point, like space and things. Am I the thing? Am I one of the things? <laughs> <laughs> Is that the bucket where I fall? I believe so, yes. Well, it's a kind of a crossover, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know. actually, I, I did not collect as a kid. I, I collected stuff. I've been a collector my whole life. And I think my first, you know, real collecting passion was like comic books and Star Wars cards and stuff like that. And, um, you know, this whole autograph bug. And it is, it's a horrible, horrible virus. I, you know, it's, I don't <laughs> It's it's I don't know what it is, but it's 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 very addictive. That all started pr like in the early '90s. So you know, I was just out of college, and it was a cold and you know snowy January or February, and I was hanging out with a buddy of mine 
from college and he said, Hey, you know, uh, I want to go down to the card shop. Stan Bonson's going to be there. So Stan Bonson, you know, New York Yankee, 1968 rookie of the year. I'm like, eh, why not? I mean, we've got nothing better to do, right? You know, two single, you know, college losers. Let's go down to the card shop and uh, hang out with Stan Bonds. And he was signing autographs for like five bucks, something like something super reasonable. So I went down and it was really cool that, you know, to the card shops, you know, chagrin, there wasn't a lot of people there, but it was like me and my buddy and Stan Bonds and just hanging out and chit chatting. And, you know, he signed baseballs for us. And, you know, it was a really cool, fun experience, you know, interacting with somebody who, you know, I, I'm really into sports and the baseball and collecting Yankees as well, among other things. So I kind of got the bug a little bit, you know, I was infected. And, you know, after that, what happened is, is then I lived down in Metro New York, Long Island at the time, and they have these card shows and memorabilia shows all over the place. So I started going to these shows and then getting more autographs and, and quickly it spread like outside of baseball to like, oh, you know, uh, Nova from the Planet of the Apes is going to be there. <laughs> I'll have her sign my, you know, these photos and this, this kind of stuff. But I've always had an interest in history. and. You know, usually like presidential, you know, like American history, and then like space was a really, you know, area of interest for me. Then when I kind of learned and started buying these magazines, a the collector magazines, oh my God, you can buy like astronaut signed photos and they look so cool. You know, it's like, oh, I mean, what looks better on the wall than like somebody standing on the moon and they signed the photo. So that's how I kind of got into it. And then lo and behold, you know, down in the metro area, like I said, they had the book signing. So I could go see, you know, Alan Bean and Gene Cernan and all these guys when they were on their book tours and, you know, they do events and, and things. So I would go to them and see them there. And then they started having the shows. Like in the early 2000s, they started having the shows where you could actually go and, you know, meet them and hang out. And it, it, so it just, it just, you know, snowballed from there. It's, it's, a, it's a horrible affliction, but I <laughs> suffered through it. So you started your collection. How do you then go in to learning about how to authenticate an autograph? Because <laughs> I imagine that's a really complex process. It's 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 an art and a science, I think, is the cliche that people use. But it it really is. It it, it rings true. You know, there's no formal training for this kind of thing. I mean, you know, technically, oh yeah, if I want to go work for the FBI, I could be a forensic document, you know, <laughs> thing. But in terms of the hobby and authenticators, they're they're typically all hobbyists. There are people who've been around the hobby for a very long time, people who've gotten autographs for a very long time. And you you learn the autographs, but you know, not to be braggadocious, you kind of have to have an eye for it too. It, it's like it just kind of clicks and you have, you can tell when something doesn't look right or wrong. So, you know, my personal, you know, my, my origin story is, is that I participated on all these chat boards back in the nineties. And I used to write for autograph times magazine. I wrote for autograph collector. I wrote for the various magazines and I was on the chat boards and I just got well known in the hobby as, as a, a fairly, you know, smart collector. And over the years, I just, you know, developed an eye. And when you see, you know, thousands and thousands of something, it, it kind of clicks. You just know how it's supposed to look. And people would start coming to me and say, hey, Steve, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? And, you know, I'd offer my opinion as a collector. Then in 2011, like Scott Cornish, who was authenticating for uh, RR Auction, for, for years, you know, who was an acquaintance of mine. And, he, you know, I knew him fairly well from the collecting community. He retired. He, he didn't want to do it anymore. And he recommended me as, you know, why don't you call Steve, see if he's interested in doing it. You know, RR is like, well, who, who can we can have come in? Because it really is a relatively small field. It's not like, you know, if you want to authenticate Babe Ruth, you know, there's 10 guys who's, you know, you know, are pretty good at doing it and those kind of things. But space is a very a much more narrow field. So RR contacted me and said, do you want to do it? And I'm like, oh, I don't know. I mean, you, you, become, the, you become the target of weirdos. And, <laughs> you know, the, the people, you know, when you come between bad guys and their money, they don't just sit back and take it. You know, it, it, there's, there's downside. 
But I said, you know what? I can't let those kind of people control my life. I can't let them dictate something that I want to do out of fear of, you know, some jackass saying nasty things about me on the internet. Right. So I said, the heck with it. Let's do it. So I started doing it and I did it anonymously for a while. Wow. At RR. I'm like, I don't want you using my name. Let me just review the stuff. Let's see how it goes. And, you know, I did it for, for months and no one knew it was me reviewing the stuff. And then, you know, they started kind of like pastoring me a little bit. Eh, can we start using your name? I mean, cause it's, it's, it's marketing, right? It's marketing for them. They want to get the, they want to get it right. They want to make sure they're, they're offering good material, but part of the, you know, part and parcel of the deal is, is that the collectors need to know who's reviewing this stuff. <laughs> Otherwise it, it's, it's kind of a weak guarantee. Like, Oh, we've had this authenticated, but we can't tell you. So I said, fine. Okay, let's do it. And so, you know, and then it just kind of like, it really took off from there. I, you know, I did that. And then suddenly other auction houses started contacting me and these other companies and collectors, Hey, can I send you my collection? So it, it really just took off from there. And, you know, I've been very blessed in a way it's, it's kind of a weird skill gift to have. And, um, you know, we, we all make mistakes. We're all human, but, you know, I think I have a pretty good reputation and a fairly high accuracy rate. So, um, and, but you're learning all the time. Mm. You're learning all okay. the time. So what are your favorite real autographs, real autographs to see? And what has you, what was your favorite item that you've ever had to authenticate? I don't know. Yeah. You know, I'll tell you who the one I can't stand authenticating the most. Rusty Schweikar, because I can never spell his name. I have to look up his name every single time. Every single time I write a letter that's got Rusty Schweikar, I honest to God, I have to Google it. I, I, there's some <laughs> mental thing. I can't, I can't get his name. Down. But, you know, favorites. Um, I mean, it's cliche, but I love, I love doing Armstrong. It's, it's a strangely simple yet complex autograph. And you look at it, oh, it's so simple and it should be so easy to fake. It's not. He had so many little subtle nuances in there and he signed so quickly and he ripped it off so quickly. That's really, really hard to fake. But, you know, I mean, just because of who he was and what he represents, that's that's always a lot of fun. You know, I, I love it when an arm starts crosses my desk. Apollo 8 might be my personal favorite. Yeah. I love Borman and Lovell. Just love them. I, you know, I've read the books, you know, don't take it personally, folks. I'm not a space geek. I really love the history. I love the story. I love the drama. I love like the human element, but I'm not going to your group to like debate, like, you know, engineering stuff. That's, that's not me. I have a very simple mind, but I love the story. I love the story, the space race. I love the personalities and Apollo is just, just, I mean, what guts it took like to go to the moon. I mean, the first one to go there, right? I mean, I mean, what guts that had to take, like just, just blasting off into the unknown and like, ah, I hope we come back. You know? So I, I love Apollo 8 and it's so uncommon because, you know, Anders was so difficult and he's still difficult to this day. Um, I mean, and it's strange. It's like the only crew that you like that are all still married to their first wives mm -hmm. and they're all still alive. Uh, so it's like, it's, it's like, they're kind of a, this really like strange anomaly. Um, and I just have so much respect for them. So I, I love when I get to, when I get to do that. And Amber, Anders is always a challenge. I think I just saw an Apollo eight beta cloth that was signed. And, um, I was like, man, that is sweet. But then I saw the price tag and I was like, <laughs> Oh, yeah. never mind. It was right. like 10 grand. Cause for a second I was like, yes, I'm going to, and then I saw the price tag. I was like, yeah no never mind because <laughs> i can't explain that to my husband so yeah where's that yeah baby where did this 10 grand go like uh, oh <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know you're not spending the money you're investing it i think that's that's the line you need to use clever Ooh. clever there it is emily there it Ooh. is from the expert <laughs> hey steve i'm not <laughs> spending the money i'm investing <laughs> there it is so uh, when you say that Bill Anders is a challenge, what, what do you mean? Just because there's not many of them or because his particular style is easy to imitate or what, what did you mean by that? Well, yeah, I mean, it's really kind of both. You know, I, I, I'm not going to play psychologist, but the man has never really favored signing autographs. And it's funny because you leave a look at back at stuff from the 60s that he was signing for other, you know, other astronauts, you know, 
from like you know, the Walt Cunningham collection or Richard Gordon or you know whatever. Um, I mean, because some of them collected, they yeah. they collected stuff. They got stuff from their colleagues signed, uh, and, and like he didn't even sign good for them or other <laughs> NASA people. He'd always sign in the corner in the dark spot. Um, you know, just I don't know, like just being difficult. I guess I I, I don't know why. I don't want to analyze the man, but he, you know. It's like a game to him, I think. And, and, and even like with in person <laughs> events, you hear that, you know, people will go up to him and under certain circumstances he'll sign and other ones he won't. He he kind of like has turned it into a game. And the other thing that he's renowned for is he's he he intentionally signs in many different styles. He'll intentionally sign it really crazy. I mean, I've you know, I've seen stuff of his where there's almost no resemblance from one to the other in some cases. Uh, but you know, the thing is, is that we're human and, and no one can ever be totally random. You always eventually end up following a pattern. So, it, you know, the pattern might be, I have six patterns, but <laughs> it, it, it typically falls in, but you know, once in a while, there's one that I, I see, I'm like, I don't know, could be, couldn't be. Um, I mean, quite honestly, when it's too nice, then I think it's probably fake. Uh, you know, when you see a Bill Ander signed perfectly in a nice, neat signature in a white spot perfect placement. I'm like, ah, that's a probably fake. Uh, it, it's, you know, the, the foragers tend to uh, do it nicer than he does. Wow. Wow. I'm pretty sure I've got an Anders. I think I do. <laughs> I didn't realize I have to dig that out. Anyway, what have been some of your most controversial decisions that you've had to make during this career? Have there been things you've had to th that people thought were high value which you have had to tell them no or uh, there are other things you've had to do that people might not like yeah well you know like i said earlier when you when you know you are in a position to tell somebody that their stuff is likely not authentic or flat out it's a horrible fake uh they tend not to be happy although you'd be surprised a lot of people they come to me and i'm like oh my god i got to tell this guy that this is fake mm. and he's like yeah i kind of thought that <laughs> you know, it, it, it's funny, but or or there'll be somebody who, you know, oh, this is a sixty dollar item, and you tell them it's fake, and they totally blow their lid. <laughs> so you, you just you just don't know what you're going to get. But it's tough, you know. Quite honestly, that the toughest one I probably ever did was the collection of a um, a collector who passed away, a middle aged man. You know, it was sudden and unexpected, and his wife. Uh, you know, wanted to liquidate the collection and it was a sizable collection. And in my estimation, there was probably over a hundred thousand dollars worth of fakes in the collection. So that's, that's really hard oh. telling, you know, a widow that like, eh, his collection, it's, it's worth a little less than you thought. Uh, you know, he still had a sizable amount of good material and it was a very, you know, high value collection, but still, you know, over a hundred grand is a lot of fakes. Mm. That's a lot of money to, to most people. Yes, that's horrible. Um, I saw recently that you've, you've decided that you had to stop authenticating new Buzz Aldrin mm, signatures. Yeah. yeah. I love the community because most people, I mean, almost everybody, one guy kind of gave me a little heat on my Facebook page, but otherwise people, they get it, right? You know, when a signature gets to the point where it looks like it's being signed like with a pen between somebody's teeth, and I mean, it's just so slow and, uh, you know, basically anyone could imitate it and it would be indistinguishable from the original. You know, my opinion is that's no longer authenticatable. I don't know if that's actually a word, but that's how I look at it. So I'm really uh, then at that point, I'm authenticating it because of where it's coming from. Yeah. And I can't do that as an authenticator. I can't say, oh, it's coming from Buzz's website, so it must be real. Uh, and I'm not saying they're not real. But I'm just saying I, I can't put my name in writing on a letter with a high degree of confidence and say, yeah, this is this is authentic because I have a ton of exemplars that back this up. I don't. So I just don't feel comfortable authenticating them. And I mean, the signatures really are quite aged looking and slow and halting and drawn. You know, it's really a shadow of of what used to be a really beautiful, elegant, and you know, free flowing signature. Mm, such a shame, but time waits for no one. Anyway, 
Moving on. Do you get a lot of stuff come your way which has been signed by the auto pen machine that I've read so much about? Uh, I'm assuming that's pretty easy to spot, right? Yeah, they're they're really easy to spot. It, you know, there's there's books of published patterns. Number one, uh, but number two, when you've seen enough of them, I, I don't even need to look at the books anymore. It just I number one, I've memorized exactly what they look like for, for <laughs> most, not not all, wow. but for the for the common ones, I just I just know. But they have a look and a feel. They they have, you know, this is where you're getting into the art part that I talked about earlier. It's they look flat and dead. There's no variation in pressure. They it, it looks like something that was signed by a machine, mm. you know, to to a trained eye. So uh, they they don't really pose a challenge to me. I think they pose a challenge to a lot of collectors. And you know what I tell people is is. Before you mail something off to me, before you send it to me, and I'm going to have to, you know, you got to pay postage. I'm going to have to, you know, if I take it into, you know, take it into my office and I review it, then I, I got to charge you, right? That's my time and effort. So just use the email opinion service first. Let's screen it through the email opinion. And I'm going to catch an auto pen like, you know, every single time that way. So I tell people do the email screening first. And if, you know, it looks like it's likely good, then then it's worth the investment of sending in. So yeah, I get a lot of auto pens, but I, I try to have people screen those first because I don't want people spending their money on, on me having to write a letter to reject an auto pen. Yeah, that seems uh, very fair and noble of you. All right, you are go for TLI. All right. Roger, stand. We're go for TLI. So one of our Patreon subscribers, uh, Charles Boyer, has asked. What percentage of autographs that come your way end up being fake? Uh, it, it really, it really varies. You know, it depends on the venue that I'm reviewing something. So, if I'm working for an auction house like RR Auction, it's relatively low. Uh, you know, it's, it's it's they have the kind of clientele and the people who submit to them. You're not you're not going to get your you know eBay scam artists submitting stuff to RR Auction. So I, I, yeah, there's some stuff that's bad, but it's usually from submitters who don't know it's bad. It's on day unknowingly or it's been in their collection for a long time, but it's relatively low for a venue like that. Now, when I review stuff on eBay or, you know, some of the big third-party authenticators use me as well, um, JSA, ACOA, PSA, they don't use me for everything they do, but they they send stuff to me and ask my opinion, very high percentage of fakes. You know, it, it could be 30, 40, 50%, depending wow. on what it is. eBay really pretty high uh, in terms of fakes, 50% or higher. No, I'm not saying that that's, you know, 50% or higher are all fakes on eBay, but the stuff that people send tend to send to me or that's not authenticated or whatever. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty high risk. I mean, they'll send me a lot. I guess see a lot of Armstrong's Gagarin's tremendous amount of fakes. Wow. Uh, probably more fakes than real. Wow. Uh, there's been a forger who's been doing Gagarin for like close to 20 years. And, and this this guy, it's a, it's a Russian artist, has pumped out tens of thousands of Gagarin fakes. And the problem is, is that, you know, a lot of these auction houses, or I shouldn't say a lot, some auction houses, they don't catch it. Or they just buy the bogus COA that it comes with, and it just keeps going on and on and on. So do you recognize particular forges as well then is there, is there like someone you can be like that's definitely that guy oh yeah absolutely yeah I and mean, see now this is the juice this is the good question you, you gotta send me this stuff <laughs> like you know i was thinking like you know they got they gotta get like into the real muckraking here but <laughs> oh yeah i mean there's 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 forgers that i rec i know who they are and yeah a forger uh -huh. has a style i mean just like a, here's here's what it is it's like when you sign your name you don't think about it Mm. It's a natural, like almost muscle memory thing. And you sign your name and there's a certain range of natural variation in that signature. Well, a forger, they have to learn the signature. And when they learn it, the tendency is they do it exactly the same every time. So it's almost like a human auto pen, right? Um, so when wow. you learn a signature, it's very, very similar. So after a while, I say, okay, this bucket, this is all the same forager. This bucket, that's all the same guy. Wow. This one's all the same people. So yeah, you you know who, and I know who some of them are. I, I they don't they don't know, but I know who they are. <laughs> um, and here's you know here's some breaking news for you. 
they come from within the hobby. They're collectors almost all the time. They're collectors who try their hand at forgery. It's every, almost every forger I know started as just a regular collector. Oh, and wow. then they want to finance their hobby. And that's how they wash the money too. They'll, they'll make stuff and they trade bad stuff for good stuff. Oh boy. This is some juicy stuff. Right. So, so like that one, the one collector who passed away, you know, you know, had a ton of fake stuff. He didn't buy that. He traded flown material for fake autographs. Uh, so the, uh, the, 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 the forger got, got real authentic flown material and the collector ended up with fakes, worthless fakes. But that's 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 another that's how they launder their money. So that's that's a common forger tactic. It's common that they come from within the hobby. They start as collectors and they go bad, or dealers. You know, dealers start needing to supplement their own inventory. They you know start running dry or whatever. So that's how it usually goes. Wow. You know, there's a couple big German forgers. I I I know who one of them is. I have a pretty good suspicion on the other one. Oh my and gosh. Yeah, it, it, I'll tell you the Germans are great forgers. <laughs> I, that's wow. it's probably the most skilled, prolific forger. Or skilled forgers is what we know as the German forger, and he's he's been around for a while. I, I you know I don't know if he's still active, but he really pumped out for a while there. You know, and then uh, you know it's it's not to discriminate against Germans. There's there's plenty of American <laughs> forgers and others as well. But I think historical collecting uh, autographs are really big in Germany. Like U.S. history and politics are really big in Germany, and the space program is very big. They're just into that, so it's just natural that there's a market there for it. So I think that's probably how it ends up happening. But there's the guy from Jersey. There's the guy from Pennsylvania. There's the guy from. Uh, Southern California, you know, there's the one from Maryland. I feel like this episode is like a cross but, between space and things and law and order or something. Yeah. Like, I love it. It's like a it's like a space and true crime like crossover, and I am here for it 100%. Yeah. Right. Those are two of my favorite things. I've always been like a fan of like the detective and the Sherlock Holmes. Yes. I, I love I love that kind of stuff. The move, the old, old black and white, you know, Basil Rathbone movies yeah. and the newer stuff. So, that's one of the that's one of the things that really I love about this this gig is like it's detective work. It's not just like catching, you know, putting the piece together to catch a bad guy, but you use the same kind of like analysis and you're thinking when you're looking at an autograph. Like, like for instance, like that that one, you know, I think on social media I shared mm -hmm. like the Michael Collins autograph. That's like Best wishes, Mike Collins with the world's longest description. And the guy says, oh, I did it. You know, I got this from Mike Collins on the street corner in Washington, D.C. in 1994 or whatever. I'm like, no, you didn't. <laughs> well, you know, Mike Collins is not standing on a street corner, like writing out a long inscription. Like if at best you'd get to Joe M. Collins, that, that's the best you would get from him standing on a street corner. Not Mike Collins, you know, Gemini, Apollo, you know, <laughs> that, that's not happening. I mean, that's a really simple example, but that's part of the authentication deal is that you have to, you have to use common sense and logic. And there is a bit of like deductive reasoning behind things. 90% of the items are like definitely real or definitely fake. That's, you know, I, I know within a second of seeing it, but that 10% where you really like, oh, I got to think about this one. It's really close. So this, this one's either authentic but a little weird a little like typical which happens or it's a really really good fake so let me kind of go into this and okay what's it signed on when is it supposed to be signed where to come what under what circumstances would you know he or she sign this way and so that's where like kind of the deductive reasoning comes in is sometimes you need something to help you off the fence if the autograph is not clear cut one way or the other Mm. Wow. Okay. I would like you on my team for an escape room, if that's okay. Anyway, the worst place to look, that would be eBay. Well, you know, eBay is a blessing and a curse. It's the worst and it's the best place to look because there's a tremendous amount of good material there too. The problem yeah. is, is that if you don't know what you're doing, yeah, it's, it's full of minefields. Right. It's, it's a minefield full of mines. <laughs> and there's a lot of sellers who just don't know what they're doing. Uh, they, they list fakes and don't know it, 
or they list really rare and desirable material under a ridiculously low price. I mean, a collector friend of mine was telling me he got like a you know Richard Feynman autograph, which is like super rare and valuable from some dealer. Didn't always do it for like thirty bucks, and it's <laughs> it's totally real, you know. But you could turn around at a, a real auction house and sell that for fifteen hundred tomorrow. The the seller didn't know what he had, no clue. Yeah. So you know, there's it, it's it's the best of worlds and it's the worst of worlds. It's it, it's a minefield, but I buy a lot of stuff on eBay. I, I don't buy as much as I used to, but when I did, I bought a lot on eBay because I know what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And if you know you're quick on the draw for a buy it now, you can get some real bargains. But mm -hmm. you yeah. can also get burned really bad too. Yeah, I've gotten I have gotten some stuff that online that was pretty good, you know. But I'm very cautious as well. Right. Like I got two uh, O'Neills and I got one Phil Chapman on a postal cover. And it mm -hmm. makes sense. To, and I was like, it makes sense that he would assign that. I'm not an authenticator like you, but it mm. looked like I looked and it looks like, you know, it looks like a pen signed it. So, right. I'm pretty sure it is. <laughs> and I got it for like $10 or something. <laughs> that That's all part of the algorithm, too. Like, I, I have this algorithm in my head. So nice. if I see an Armstrong or a Grissom or a John Young that. Eh, it's a little weird, you know, is this a really good fake or is this an authentic, but atypical example? I'm going to spend a lot of time and thought on that because the algorithm says like, this is high risk. You know, skilled forgers are doing these autographs. Mm -hmm. Phil Chapman, eh, you know, quite honestly, I mean, anything can be faked. $5 autographs can be faked, but that's part of the algorithm. Like if I see a Phil Chapman and it's a little weird looking, I'm probably going to say, eh, it's probably just atypical. Skilled yeah. forgers are not cranking out Phil Chapmans. <laughs> um, if there's a Phil Chapman and it's fake, it's probably just some kitchen table forger who's really not very skilled and it'll be obvious. So, you know, that's that's kind of the the, the calculus that you have to do in your head. Mm, of course, that makes a lot of sense. So we are getting into this, but what tips have you got for those who perhaps are in the market for a big ticket item? Are there any sellers you'd recommend? Uh, or maybe there's some people who are just starting their collections. Any top tips for those uh, those kind of people too? Well, first of all, with a big ticket item, don't be impulsive. Do your homework. Be smart about it. You know, um, And by doing your homework, you know, check out the source, network with other collectors, use reliable authentication services. Uh, you know, don't, it's, it's always, you know, the best deal sometimes is the one that you don't make. Mm. So, you know, that's, that's my advice for big ticket items. Um, you know, for lower ticket items, it's, it's kind of the same, but it's not going to be quite the Manhattan project that, that, that a big, big ticket item might be is just, you know, know the sellers, do your homework. Not everyone can become an autograph expert. They don't have the desire or they don't have the time. I mean, you know, people say, well, you know, Steve, you know, how, how do you do this? I'm like, well, it's it's 25 years experience. It's just looking at things for decades. You kind of get the look and feel. So, you know, use my services or other reputable authenticators that that know what they're doing. So, you know, if, if you do your homework and you network with other collectors, you know, these online forums can be really great. There's various forums that are, that are dedicated strictly to autographs. You know, Richard Garner has one, which is really good. And there's a lot of sharing there. I'm not saying everyone who's a, who's a member of that is, is, is an expert, but, you know, you can float your ideas past that forum. If you, if you don't want to use a paid service, at the very least, connect with knowledgeable collectors and, you know, try to pick their brain. Uh, before you make any purchases. Now, in terms of dealers, I mean, I, I tend not to issue blanket endorsements because everyone makes mistakes. If, you know, the best dealers have offered stuff that I would probably disagree with. And maybe they're right. Maybe I'm right. I, I don't know. But, you know, in the worst dealers occasionally offer something that's authentic. <laughs> so it, it's there's no 100% ironclad guarantee. I hate to say to somebody, oh, this dealer is good. And then they just, you know, buy blindly from that dealer because that's what ends up happening a lot is people form loyalty to a dealer and you know over time that that might end up burning them you know good dealers fine but there's you know there's dealers that maybe aren't so great that people are loyal to for one reason or another all right all right so i i have two follow-ups number one you've mentioned a few times about 
everyone being human and making mistakes. Have you ever done? A, have you ever made a mistake where afterwards you've realised and felt really bad about it? Oh, ab- absolutely. <laughs> I have. <laughs> um, I, I remember early in my authentication career, there was a a photo signed by Grissom and John Young, and I, I reviewed it. Not my. I reviewed it for another company, and I'm like, oh, I'm kind of on the fence with this. It's close enough. I, so, so I gave it a, I gave it a thumbs up. And then um, two weeks later or a week later or whatever, another one showed up. And I'm like, oh, that was the test. They got me. And the other one that showed up was like exactly like the first one, the same little problems and the things that concern me about the first one. But I said, eh, it's probably okay. When I saw the second one, I'm like, oh, you screwed up. So I rejected the second one. And I went back to the company and I said, you, you got to pull that one. You know, just do what you do to get it back. I, I messed up, and they did. They did. So um, that that's an example. I, you know, listen, I've I've authenticated tens of thousands of items in the last you know ten years. I would be a liar or delusional to think that if I went through forty or fifty thousand items, I'm going to be in a hundred percent agreement with mm. what I thought eight years ago. Uh, you grow and learn over time. I, I still think the accuracy rate is very, very high, but I'm not perfect. I'm human. And, you know, there's some judgment involved. You get certain signatures, like I said before, that, geez, is this, is this a really good fake or is it just, you know, Armstrong was not in a great mood and he <laughs> yeah. just, he didn't want to sign for this person. Uh, so, you know, I mean, I, I think that's a very small percentage, but yeah, it, it happens. You know, and it, I hate to even admit anything like this. I'll be honest. It's it's true. But, you know, this is the kind of thing that, you know, the various haters and trolls say, Steve Zarelli has, admits he's authenticated fakes. You know, I mean, that's that's the kind of stuff that you deal with online sometimes. So mm. it is what it is. It is what it is. Do you know what? I love your honesty about all this. It makes, it, uh, makes me trust you even more. Anyway, I have another question, which I should have asked earlier. When you're learning to authenticate signatures is it useful to stand next to that person and watch them sign the signature 50 to 100 times and learn how the pen moves or is it all about analysis of what's on the page it's a little of both so i do like to you know watch video when i can of them signing because that that has a lot to do with the analysis sometimes like oh this person's hand should be moving in this direction and it's, it's, I love it when I see a little tick mark at the bottom flying off this way. That's a good sign, right? Or, but if I see the same one and the tick marks going the opposite way, well, eh, that's not how that person's hand moved. So, yeah, I, I study video. And when I do go to shows, I've watched and I actually promoted a show with the late, great Al Howlingquist back in 2004 at the Space Walk of Fame. And, uh, you know, Al was a a very dear friend and a mentor to me. Um, You know, he wasn't so much into the authentication, but, you know, in terms of just overall collecting, you know, he was a great, great collecting mentor and he was friends with lots of the astronauts and, you know, he, he, he was a great supporter of mine and I I miss him dearly, but we promoted it. We did a show together back in 2004 and, you know, I got to sit there next to, you know, Dave Scott and, and Paul Weitz and Charlie Duke and Mitchell and just watch them sign it. You know, it's great. It, it was, it was really a lot of fun. I know that you were very close with Al Worden and um, I didn't really know Al, but I, I met him a few times. And uh, one of my favorite pictures is from that 2004 show in Florida. It was like hot as hell inside of this place and it was humid. And I, it might've been like in July or August. I forgot exactly when it was, but, you know, Al was at the show and we had a cocktail party after the show. And it's a photo of, you know, me and Al standing next to each other. And we're both lit. I mean, both of our faces are beet red and sweat and like crazy. <laughs> and we have drinks in our hand. But it was it was a great time. And I, I really <laughs> I, I, I get a kick out of looking at that photo sometimes. Yeah, he was. Oh gosh, now I'm. No, I'm all emotional. Yeah, he was a trip. He was just a real mm. guy. Like, yeah, he went to the moon, but it was like once you got to know him, he was just a real, a regular person. Yeah. So, you know, Al Al was, you know, really, really human. And, you know, one of the quick anecdote is that I 
think it was like at the Hall of Fame induction and it was right after 9-11. I think it was like November of 2001, if I recall correctly. And um, I actually, I was at the World Trade Center. I worked there uh, on 9-11. And thankfully, I got out. Wow. Um, wow. But, you know, I, I, you know, it was a month and a half later or whatever it was in, you know, just starting to fly again. And I went down to Florida for the show and uh, the induction show. And Al was there. And, you know, there was a line of people to get stuff signed. And, and, and my Al Hollenquist was standing next to Al Worden. And, I, you know, I got to the front of the line. And, hey, 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 and Al went down and whispered something in the, you know, Al Worden's ear. And he, I guess he told him I was at the World Trade Center. So Al gets up and he hugs me. And then he signed a photo. He said, and the photo says, thank God you are here. And um, I'll never get rid of that photo. I mean, that's that's very special to me. <laughs> See, now you're getting me choked up, too. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, my God. I'm going to start. We. I'm sorry. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> that is so heavy. Wow. That's a story. Oh, thank you for yeah. sharing that with us. Yeah, he was he was he was a really nice, a really genuine guy. Well, as I said, thank you very much for sharing that story with us. Right, so we've had true crime and we've had some emotions. So uh Yeah, soap I, opera and true crime. Yeah, there it is. There it is. I think uh <laughs> We this laughed, is, we cried, it was wonderful. Yeah. It I was think, awesome. I think it's a great interview. Steve, this <laughs> definitely falls into the things category, I think. <laughs> but thank you so much for joining us. This has been absolutely wonderful and uh We love what you do. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Love love being here. Happy to come back anytime. That was really amazing. And I know some of our guests are probably like, why don't they have this? This is kind of a weird, you know, topic, you know, this week. But it it really isn't to me because I'm somebody who does have, you know, an autograph collection. I, I and I never set out to build one. I just sort of developed one over the years, you know, and um this is, I think it's really important, especially, you know, I, I don't plan on dying anytime soon. I don't want people to be like, you know, hear people hear this and be like, Emily's going to die or something. But, you know, if I ever croak someday or something like that, and Steve's like, you know, my husband, you know, is like, well, I have all this autographed stuff, you know, what should I do with it? You know, authenticators are really important for that kind of thing. Yeah. You know, if he doesn't want to keep it, he could probably donate it or maybe you know an auction house can get it or something like that you know i don't i'm not gonna die anytime soon i'm just saying you know god forbid if but you know i don't think he he wants all the space books so he'd probably (laughs) you know i can't see him wanting to hang on to all that it's so true though because i think all of like as as we said in the intro to the to to the interview like most people who listen to this have probably collected something particularly to do with space i mean i think space and collection kind of goes hand in hand as i said earlier so it's no like it, it wouldn't surprise me if majority of people here have got a book which is signed by a national at least absolutely uh, you know and 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 for me the pieces i've got have all been given to me or uh i've got f- from being at a book signing or something like that so i find that stuff it's for me not necessarily i don't think of it as being an investment or something that's going to be sold on but at some point I will die, right? We've all got to die and someone might get that book and it might be worth something. So you're right. Actually, that's where those authenticators really do come in handy. Uh, And also, there's that dark side of what they have to do and and dealing with these these forgers all around the world and, and all that kind of stuff, which is just crazy. Those of you who know me on social media, I'm obsessed with fraud. I'm such a loser. Like... We should just have a, a a separate podcast like extension called Space Frauds or something like that. <laughs> I don't know, but I love uh, true crime and stuff like that. And I love stories about people just doing dumb stuff and getting straight up caught. And everybody's like, we all knew this was happening. So, um, yeah, hearing about that to me was just juicy because it's like I'm not a paranoid person. But the, at the same time, it's like you do have to be if you're a collector and I, I'll be honest, I have bought a couple things off eBay, you know, 
blind and eth- but I I bought stuff that I think the person who got it didn't know what it was. And so it was very inexpensive. So I was like, well, if it is a fake, uh, it's 25 bucks. I'm not out of like $2,000. You know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. so I felt it was probably un- more, maybe more unlikely that it was fake, if that makes sense. So you just yeah. got to be really careful. That That's the thing. Like, you know, and I've seen people before who've bought, you know, oh, yeah, I got this Neil Armstrong. And I'm like, oh, no, like, oh, my God, how yeah, much yeah, did yeah. you, you know, you, you, this does happen. You know, and I, I forgot I read this was years ago and I forgot where I read it. I don't know where I read it, but I read years ago that most of the Armstrong signatures on eBay are fake. Yeah. And I'm like, you really have to be careful. You know, these are investment. Some of these are investment pieces. You know, I personally collect for just personal excitement. But, you know, some of these are investments, you know, things you might either resell or gift to a family member like as an heirloom and you do want to kind of protect that investment and make sure it actually is an investment so. yeah because that story of of the uh, of the widow turning up with this massive collection and it being <laughs> fake and it being yeah you know, that's just horrible isn't it it's just horrible yeah anyway that was a great interview that, that was, was a wonderful. great interview. I'm glad we did that. So the full unedited version of that interview is up on our Patreon page, patreon.com forward slash space and things. And we'll have links to Steve's social media and his company website in our show notes. Uh, if you have anything that needs authenticating, definitely check that website out for sure uh the show notes are in full on our website which is space and things podcast.com if you're listening to this episode after the week it comes out then you'll find them in the archive but there is a direct link in the episode description which you can find on your podcast platform Okay, so we've got two weeks' worth of news to catch up on. Uh, there have been six launches, two in China, one in Kazakhstan, which was delivering a progress resupply ship to the International Space Station, one in Japan, which was the first Japanese launch of this calendar year, one in French Guiana, and one in South Korea, which was the first flight of an entirely South Korean launcher, the KSLV-2. Unfortunately, while it did reach its target apogee, the rocket didn't make it into orbit, and the cause of that failure hasn't yet been confirmed. Confirmed. But it's great to see another nation joining the space party. Uh, so for full details of the payloads and the videos of the launches, head over to our show notes. There was supposed to be a new crew heading up to the ISS aboard a SpaceX Dragon capsule in the last few weeks. But unfortunately, the crew mission or the crew three mission first got delayed by weather. And then one of the astronauts had a medical problem, which has caused the mission to be pushed back until uh, this Saturday. November 6th at the earliest, so hopefully we'll have that to talk about next week. It's a brand new Dragon capsule that has been called Endurance, and apparently it has an improved toilet system, which should prevent Mm -hmm. any problems like the ones experienced by the Inspiration4 crew. Yeah, apparently things were that bad on the Inspiration4 mission that the Crew 2 mission, which are currently on the ISS, have been told they're not allowed to use the toilet on their way back to Earth from the International Space Station. Crazy. According to uh, Steve Stitch, NASA's commercial crew program manager, there are, quote, other ways to allow the crew to perform the functions they need, quote. Yes, yes. I do love the fact that uh, they can't just say, use the toilet, rather than, (laughs) they have to say, perform the functions. Anyway, uh, yeah, I'm sure (laughs) they'll be fine. Uh, But I'm sure anyway that they're still buzzing about the fact that they got to eat tacos they made with green chili peppers, which they've grown on board the station. Uh, Not the first tacos in space. I'm pretty sure they've been doing that for a while, although Emily is our taco (laughs) expert. But the Crew 2 astronauts would have missed all the chili pepper goodness if the Crew 3 mission had launched on time. So, you know, a little bit of a blessing for them there. The harvest took place on the 29th of October, and the good news is that a few of the peppers even produced flowers which have been used to germinate another crop. So we'll have another generation up there soon of these green chili peppers. Obviously, one of the key reasons for growing things on the space station is to try and plan for long duration missions. And anyone who has seen The Martian knows the importance of space botany. And while we're talking about long duration missions, uh, Blue Origin have announced that they've teamed up with Boeing, Sierra Space and several other partners to build a commercial space station called Orbital Reef. And they're hoping to have that up and running in the late 2020s. 
Uh, this announcement was just four days after NanoRacks, Voyager Space, and Lockheed Martin unveiled plans for their own station called Star Lab. I wonder where they got the idea for that name. Uh, it's crazy, <laughs> right? It's crazy to think that within the next decade, we may have four or five space stations orbiting the Earth at the same time. I think that's awesome, though. That's going to be awesome. It's so cool, isn't it? It's so cool. Meanwhile, on Mars, uh, after a communications blackout, which was caused by a solar conjunction, which is when the sun falls between the Earth and Mars, it happens every two years and lasts for about two weeks. Anyway, after that, our little helicopter friend, Ingenuity, has made its 14th flight. Uh, now, what marks this one out as important is that we are now in summer conditions in that part of Mars, so the temperature is slightly higher. So in order to fly, the rotor blades have to go even faster, 2,700 revolutions per minute instead of 2,536 revolutions that it's been doing so far. The flight was just a short hop to prove that it could do this. And this is all rather good news. And the information from this will help with the design in the, of the next generation of Mars helicopters. That's such a great thing to be able to say. Anyway, also, NASA now has a Perseverance rover website just to showcase the sounds that have been recorded from the surface, like the audio that you might now be able to hear in the background right now, which was recorded in May and captures the sound of Ingenuity's fourth flight pretty cool stuff that is awesome man it's like the mars version of airwolf i love it yes uh back on earth uh things are getting rather exciting for the artemis program as the space launch system or sls rocket is now fully stacked inside the vehicle assembly building at kennedy space center complete with the orion crew capsule nasa has announced that the rocket will launch on february 12th 2022 and we'll send the uncrewed Orion capsule around the moon on a flight called Artemis 1. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah, uh, I know. I can't wait. We are so excited about this as it's the start of the process to get humans back on the moon, which should happen within the next few years. However, there is so much to be done for this uh, as it still hasn't been decided what craft will be used to land on the moon. In April, NASA selected SpaceX to be the only company to carry on developing its human landing system. But after protests from Blue Origin and Dynetics, the other companies who were in the running, NASA has been instructed by the U.S. Senate to choose a second company to develop a lander, although they've only allocated a small increase in the budget to make this happen. So good news and bad news, but I still can't wait to see that rocket launch. That I, I got to go see it. Oh, my God. Oh, man. If you've never seen a Saturn V, you got to go. You got to at least watch this on TV. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Some people online are getting very into this. And uh, I saw an image that been doctored, obviously, uh, of what it might look like when the solid rocket boosters yeah, leave. Yeah, I saw the that. The rocket during launch. Oh, my God. It got me very excited. Yeah, it. it I loved it because it, it, I think they took some early, um, some shuttle stuff and sort of like uh, mocked it up. Some Photoshop I, skills. Yeah, they mocked it up and made it look, you know, similar because it has the similar boosters. So I'm like, oh, my God, that's so freaking cool. Oh, my God, I'll stop. Yeah. Yes. We're look, both looking forward to that. Anyway, <laughs> so this bit's uh, slightly a bit of a change of attack, but politicians from around the world are currently meeting in Glasgow to discuss climate change. And while that's going on, two British rocket startup companies have released some test results of their biofuel research as they both plan to launch their rockets from Scotland using biofuels. Um, that word, again, when we did our episodes about biofuels, why can I not say bi bio? Biofuels. Anyway, <laughs> <It's okay. laughs> there's an Edinburgh-based company called Skyrora, and they plan to fly their rocket from a fuel made from non-recyclable plastics, while there's an Inverness-based company, Orbex, who are planning on using biopropane, which is a natural gas made as a byproduct of biodiesel production. You may remember that we also spoke to the people at Blue Shift Aerospace uh, earlier this year as they launched the first commercial biofuel rocket from Maine. Uh, now, this is an area of the industry which I'm really interested in, and I'm glad to see this is happening. While most experts don't believe that the carbon dioxide emissions of spaceflight are too much of a concern at the moment, as there aren't that many launches, it's important that people are looking at alternatives for when that increase in flights really does ramp up. Also, one of the major issues of rockets on the environment 
is the soot, which is injected into the upper layers of the Earth's atmosphere. This soot can absorb heat and affect the temperature of those higher layers known as the mesosphere and stratosphere, with experts saying that 120 launches a year emit the same amount of soot as the whole of the global aviation industry in a year. Bearing in mind we've already had 105 orbital launch attempts this year, you can see that this is a problem. So the environmental impact is one of the big things that gets brought up by people who don't seem to like space flight in arguments against it. And while we can all list many counter arguments, knowing that there are companies doing something to at least try and reduce this impact, to me, seems very important. I don't know about you, Emily. Yeah, I, I agree totally. Um, somebody actually brought it up in the comments for my for the article I did about Elon Musk. You know, OK, you're worried about gender equality and things like that and racial equality. Why aren't you worried about the environment? And I agree that's a good point, you know, that that is something you know, as space flight becomes more regular, um, it, it is something we're going to have to think about a lot more, I think. You know, I, I don't think we thought about it probably 40 years ago because the shuttle didn't launch as many times as they, they said it would, you know. And now, yeah. you know, we got SpaceX, we got Blue Origin, we got we got a lot of different... And all the different countries. Yes. Yeah, we got ESA, we got, you know, the Russians, we got now we got South Korea, you know. and Yeah. So it's something, Israel, Japan, so on and so forth. Exactly. Not to mention, you know, the private companies who are just, yeah. you know, launching things as well. So it's it's definitely something, you know, that needs to be addressed. I totally agree with you. And finally, uh, Disney has released the trailer for Lightyear, a Buzz Lightyear origin story, and it looks fantastic. Yes. I'm I'm excited about it. Uh, we <laughs> did mention uh, Space Jam a few months ago. <laughs> So we've got to mention this movie, too, although I I think this one might inspire more kids to want to go to space than uh, Space Jam, perhaps. So, Yeah, I think so, too. I think so, too. It, it might seem silly, but I, I think this this is exactly the kind of movie that, that will get kids inspired about space. It's just it from looks, the trailer, you know, the, the, the audio they use for, for the launch was like a mission control launch. And you can see how that could correspond. They did all the go, no go for flights. And it was all the, the terms that you would use and see in an Apollo flight, the historical mission. So I loved it. I thought it was great. I can't wait to see the film. Me too. I mean, uh, I'll be the oldest person in the theater seeing that. I don't care. I got to see Buzz Lightyear. Yeah, I've already bagged that I'm going to be taking my nephews to see that one at yep. cinema. I can't. Yeah, that's yep, what's happening. We got to see it. Uh, Roger, our guidance recommendation uh, is pings, and you're cleared for takeoff. Roger, understand. We're number one on the runway. Roger. <laughs> Okay, that's it for this week. Thanks again for those of you who continue to support the podcast by purchasing merchandise, patches or pins, or getting all of those things by signing up to our Patreon page and much more. That's patreon.com forward slash space and things as we mentioned earlier. Uh, You can also help us out just by pressing the share button and posting links to your friends. We've seen quite a bit of this recently, and we thank you. October was our highest month of listeners by quite a margin, and we've now had over 20,000 downloads. Wow, that is awesome. Well, thank you all very much for listening. Uh, So much good stuff is coming up this month, too. But right now, don't forget, in space, no one can hear you mean. Nope. (laughs) Space and Things has been brought to you by And Things Productions.